A lot of folks don't realize that Nintendo's 8-bit home game consoles had two processors inside. There's the central processor, which runs the code from the games. But there's also another processor that's dedicated to handling the graphics. Today we're going to dig into that chip and take an in-depth look into how the Nintendo's picture processing unit works. This is episode 4 of my series called Inside the Famicom. Thanks for joining me in episode number four of my Famicom Deep Dive series. In the previous episodes, we went over the overall design of the system, talked about how the CPU works, and took an in-depth look at the memory architecture. If you pop the hood on a Famicom or NES, you'll notice that there's another large chip located next to the CPU. This is the graphics processor, which Nintendo calls the PPU or Picture Processing Unit. Like the CPU, the PPU is an actual processor. It has a clock signal and a set of address and data pins just like the CPU. Unlike the CPU, however, the PPU doesn't fetch and execute instructions. Instead, it's designed to pull data off its bus, process it, and display it on a screen. Because it's a processor, the PPU operates independently from the CPU. A good example of this is what happens when you do a live cartridge swap. As you can see here, I have a game of Tetris running on my AV Famicom. If I pause the game and pull out the cartridge without turning it off, the CPU enters a halted state. But notice that the graphics, though garbled, are still being displayed on the screen. Now I'll insert Donkey Kong, and you'll notice that the screen redraws even though the CPU is halted. This is because the PPU is still running, and it's pulling the tiles and sprites from the character ROM chip in the Donkey Kong cartridge. If you look closely, you can even see Mario's face here. And when I remove Donkey Kong and insert Super Mario Bros., the screen redraws again, but this time with tiles and sprites from the Super Mario cartridge. You can even see the top half of three coins. And finally, when I reinsert the Tetris cartridge, the screen redraws again, but this time with the correct graphics, since it's now reading from the Tetris character ROM. You'll find two types of PPUs in the Famicom and NES. If you're in a country that uses the NTSC standard, you'll find a Ricoh 2C02 chip. But if you're in a country that uses the PAL standard, your chip will be a Ricoh 2C07. These chips are functionally the same. The main difference between the two is the clock speed and clock dividers that generate the video signal. Similar to the CPU, the PPU is also a 40-pin chip. One thing that's unique about it, though, is that it connects to two different sets of buses. The read-write pin, the eight data pins, and these three address pins all connect to the same buses that the CPU is on. These address and data lines enable the CPU to communicate with the PPU. In episode 3, I explained that because the PPU only has three address lines on the CPU's address bus, it only provides eight unique memory locations for the CPU to address. In the schematic, these three lines are referred to as RS0 through RS2. And in this case, RS likely stands for register select because each of these memory locations is assigned to a different set of registers inside the PPU. I'll talk more about these registers in the next episode when we talk about how graphics are rendered to the screen. On the other side of the chip, there are 14 pins that are on a different bus. All 14 of these pins are connected to a separate address bus that's dedicated to the PPU. So if you do the math, you'll find that it can address 16 kilobytes of memory. On this bus, you'll find chips that are only accessible to the PPU. The CPU doesn't have direct access to anything on this second bus. In particular, there's another 2 kilobyte RAM chip 
which is the chip labeled U4 on the mainboard. This provides a dedicated space to hold the data that defines how the graphics are laid out. Nintendo refers to this area in memory as a name table. We'll dig into that more in the next episode. In addition to the PPU's RAM chip, the bus also extends to the cartridge slot. From here, you'll typically find these pins connecting to a ROM chip called the character ROM. This is the chip on the cartridge that holds the graphics that are displayed on the screen. If you think back to the live cartridge swap that we did earlier, the reason you saw Mario's face on the Tetris screen is because Mario's face was occupying the same memory location in the character ROM chip as those Tetris graphics. For games with more complex graphics, you may find a mapper chip instead of a character ROM. I'll talk more about that when I get to the cartridge episode later on in this series. But for now, just know that the address bus extends to the cartridge slot in order to access graphics that are stored on the cartridge in some manner. But you might be asking, where are the data pins? Well, the PPU handles the data by using a technique called multiplexing. This enables it to use eight of the address pins for both the address and data bus. These are noted in the schematic with the label AD0 through AD7 with AD meaning address and data. But it has to be one or the other. You can't use these pins for both buses at the same time. So in order to multiplex these lines, the console uses an octal latch, which is the LS373 logic chip labeled U2 on the mainboard. The PPU will first use all 14 of the pins for the address bus by placing the memory address on these pins. However, the eight pins that are multiplexed are connected to the octal latch. During this time, the PPU sets a special signal called address latch enable or ALE. When ALE is set to high, the octal latch activates and it captures the data that the PPU placed on its input pins. The output pins of the octal latch are connected to the address bus that the video RAM chip is on. Once the address data is latched in, the PPU can then repurpose those same eight pins for the data bus. At this point, the octal latch is now what's supplying the lower eight bits of the address data, so the PPU doesn't have to do it itself. The 16 kilobytes of memory addressable by the PPU is split up into four different regions. The first eight kilobyte segment is mapped to the cartridge slot. When the PPU accesses this region from address 0000 through 1FFF, it reads the graphics from the character ROM on the cartridge. Inside the character ROM, the graphics are laid out in two tables called the pattern tables. One pattern table is dedicated to holding the background tiles. When these tiles are painted on the screen, they can scroll either horizontally or vertically, but they can't move around on their own. The other table is dedicated to holding sprites. These are the graphics that can change position and move around on the screen. The next four kilobytes of memory from 2000 through 2FFF are mapped to the PPU's RAM chip. But this chip is only two kilobytes in size, so the contents within this address range are mirrored. To understand why the mirroring is needed, we need to dig deeper into how the Famicom handles graphics. Now that's going to be a little bit lengthier of a topic, so I'm going to save that one for episode number five. The next 3,840 bytes of addresses are normally unused. Looking at the schematic, you'll notice that the chip select signal on the RAM chip is connected to pin 48 of the cartridge slot. Most of the time, cartridges will connect pin 48 to pin 49. When PPU address line 13 is set to high, the signal runs through this inverter and gets converted to a low signal on pin 49. So if pin 48 is connected to it, that low signal activates the RAM chip on the bus. If you look at the binary representation for the address range 2000 through 3EFF, you'll notice that bit 13 is always set to one. So if the cartridge connects pins 48 and 49, then any address in that range will access the RAM chip. 
And since the PPU only reads the RAM chip from 2000 through 2FFF, there's really no reason for it to ever use this other portion of memory addresses. The final 256 bytes of the PPU's memory map don't reference either the RAM chip or the character ROM. Despite it being in the range that activates the RAM chip on the bus, the final 256 bytes actually maps to a portion of internal memory inside the PPU. Here, the PPU stores information about which color palettes the game is using. The palette RAM isn't the only memory that's built into the PPU. The PPU also contains 256 bytes that's designated as object attribute memory. This 256 bytes is divided into 64 chunks that are four bytes each. Each chunk of four bytes contains the data about an individual sprite. The first and fourth bytes contain the sprite's Y and X position on the screen in that order. The second byte is the index number of the sprite's entry in the pattern table on the cartridge. And the third byte contains the data for the sprite's color palette, its Z index position, and whether the sprite is flipped horizontally or vertically. This data contains everything that the PPU needs to know in order to draw the sprite on the screen. And since there's only enough space and object attribute memory for 64 sprites, that gives the PPU a hard limit of displaying 64 sprites at any given time. And in addition to that, there's also a limit of eight sprites per scan line. You will, however, occasionally see some games that push these limits by alternating which sprites are drawn to the screen each frame. And when this happens, it causes the sprites to flicker. Before we wrap up this episode, I wanna look at just one more pin on the PPU. Pin 21 is labeled as video in the schematic. Now, as I discussed in the first episode, the Famicom launched with an RF modulator for its video and audio signal. But if I connect my oscilloscope to this pin, what you'll actually see is a composite video signal. That's right, the PPU natively produces composite video. And if you want a really inexpensive composite mod for your Famicom, all you need to do is use a transistor to amplify the signal coming out of pin 21. We talked about quite a bit today, but there's still more to cover on this topic. So in the next episode, I'm going to go deeper into how the Famicom processes graphics, and we'll revisit a couple of the topics that we just touched on in this video. All right, that's it for today. I'll see you next time. But as always, until then, go make something cool. <laughs>